be seated. Uh, this story could hardly be more dramatic than it is. Saul puts himself in the most vulnerable position possible, and David, with every opportunity to secretly kill him, refuses and spares his life. And after that, they have an exchange where David um, proves his innocence, and Saul recognizes it and leaves off, for a time, his persecution. It's an, it's an astonishing story, and David here demonstrates um, an astonishing love for his enemy. His eye spares. He, his eye looks upon Saul with compassion, the man who is hunting him like a wild animal. Um, it's an astonishing demonstration of exactly what Christ commands us in the Gospels to love our enemies. And uh, as, we, as we look at this story and, and unfold the details in it, we're going to see in the story four reasons why we must show mercy to our enemies. In verses 1 through 7, we will see that we should love our enemies because the world does not know God. And they come to know God when they see our example. So verses 1 through 7 is because they don't know God. Um, in verses 8 through 14, we, we see that we should love our enemies because we have respect for God. Out of our respect for God, we will love our enemies. In verses 12 through 15, we will see that we should love our enemies because God is judge. And he will take care of us. In verses, and then lastly, fourthly, verses 16 through 22, we will see that we should love our enemies because our mercy convicts sinners. It's a tool that God uses uh, to bring conviction of sin and the hope of salvation to the wicked. So let's, let's begin our text, verses 1 through 7, as we see how we should love our enemies. Note, as our story begins, Saul is um, continuing to pursue David. Uh, when we left off the story last week, um, uh, Saul had, had, to, had to leave off his pursuit of David because the Philistines invaded. Right at that moment when, when Saul had David dead to rights, he got word that the Philistines had invaded and he had to leave. He had to leave David there and go find the Philistines and drive them off. And David went from there. He traveled a good distance to the east and he is now at the um, stronghold at En Gedi. Uh, the, the place of En Gedi is named after a spring of water and there's abundant water there. And that, that area along the coast of the Dead Sea is filled with caves. It's a very rugged country right there on the western coast of the Dead Sea. And David has plenty of water there at the spring. And he also has plenty of caves in which to hide. It's a very rugged place. That's where the, um, uh, there, there are strongholds all over that part. Uh, very, very rugged and inaccessible, uh, but also uh, with, cave, with caves and water. So he's got a, a good place to hide. And you'll notice our story begins that as soon as Saul has finished driving off the Philistines, he immediately renews his pursuit for David. And he finds out that he's in the wilderness of En Gedi. And so he takes 3,000 choice men, that is battle-hardened, experienced soldiers who've proven themselves in the recent campaign. Um, he chooses them to go after David. And David has about 600 men with him. So Saul outnumbers him five to one as he pursues him into the wilderness. And you'll notice how in our text that Saul almost catches David. And we know that because of where this interaction takes place. It says in verse 3, so that Saul, he comes to the sheepfolds by the road. So the shepherds there in their area, they, they have their sheep staying in the night. They're right by the road. And there was a cave. And David and his men are in the cave right by the road. Now ask yourself, in an area that's filled with caves and lots of hiding places, why would David hide right by the road that Saul is going to come in on? Why would he do that? And the answer is because he was on that road when Saul was about to catch up to him and he had to hide somewhere. So I think the fact that this cave is right by the road, it tells us that Saul, unbeknownst to himself, was right hot on David's heels and was about to catch him again. And, and, that, and that's the reason why Saul had, or David had to jump into the cave by the road and hide in this apparently relatively large cave right there by the road. And so the story comes in as, as, as Saul comes in, um, his army is coming on that road by the cave. He sees the cave by the road, and our text says he went to attend to his needs. That's a euphemism for using the toilet. <laughs> 
That's what, they, that's what Saul is going in there to do. He's leaving his army behind. He's finding a private place to relieve himself, and he could not be in a more vulnerable position. He has no idea that David and 600 men are hiding in the back of this cave. And he goes in there to use the toilet, and David and his men are watching this. And they're seeing what Saul is doing as he takes care of his business, and they realize that Saul could not be in a more vulnerable position than he is in. The only way he could be more vulnerable is if he fell asleep in the cave, which actually, ironically, that's what's going to happen in chapter 26, is David is going to find Saul when he's asleep. And so apart from being asleep, this is the most vulnerable he could be. He is, um, he literally, he's at David's mercy. And so you notice how David and his, David's men tempt him to commit murder. And they use God as their excuse. Did you see that in verse 4? They said, the men of David say to him, today is the day that the Lord has said to you, behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand that you can do with him as seems good to you. And so they, they correctly understand that God is the one who is guiding these events. Yes, in the providence of God, Saul is there in the cave. Yes, in the providence of God, David and his men are armed and ready in the back of that cave. That is all happening under the province of God. But what, they, but what David's men do not understand is they don't understand the character of God. The Bible is very clear. God neither is tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. Would God tempt David to murder? No. Would, would God ever say to a human being, do as seems good to you? Is that the wisdom and counsel of Almighty God? Do what's right in your own eyes? No, that's the wisdom of the world. That's the wisdom of the flesh. That's the desire of, the, of our own sinful nature to do what is right in our own eyes. That's not what God would say to us. That's what our sinful nature would tempt us with. And so David's men, they see the circumstances around them and they understand God is guiding things, but they do not know who God is. How will they ever understand God's character, if David kills Saul? How will they get a glimpse of who God really is if David treats his enemies the way the world says to treat your enemies? No, what, what David does here as he shows mercy to Saul, he is teaching his men about who God really is. And not, notice in verse 6 how David instructs his men in who God really is. Look at what he says in verse 6. The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master. It is contrary to God's nature. It is contrary to God's law for a man to take vengeance in his own hands. Instead, what does God command? God commands us to love our enemies. And so David, David is willing to and he is determined to show mercy to Saul, not just for Saul's sake, but also for the sake of his men so that they can understand who God is. Because apparently these men are following David and they're watching him live, but they don't understand who God is. So they need an example of someone who trusts in God, someone who knows and understands and perceives the mercy of God. They need to see a living example of that so they can understand who God is. How will the world ever understand that the God that we serve is merciful and forgiving if the people who worship him are not merciful and forgiving? If they see us reacting out of the flesh, if they see us responding to spite with spite, if they see us respond to disrespect with contempt, if they see us respond to insults with um, our fists, how will they ever learn that God is a merciful God? They, the world cannot understand God, and that's why we are here. We're here on this earth to be salt and light to be a reflection of the character of God for the world to see. Christ commands us to love our enemies because the world doesn't know who he is. And they need to see it in us. And so David, not just for Saul's sake, but for the sake of his men, he shows mercy to Saul so that they would see and understand who Yahweh really is. We must love our enemies because the world doesn't know God. They need to see that in us. And, you know, the world, it does. It, it, um, 
it, it ridicules Christians for being doormats. When, when, a non, when an unbeliever uh, hears the command of Christ to um, love your enemies, to bless those who persecute you, they look at that and they ridicule that and they say, I'm not going to be a doormat. Why would I ever follow that? And they use that as an excuse to ridicule Christianity until the day they are the recipient of mercy. When, when they are the recipient of forgiveness they know they didn't deserve, that's when, it makes, that's when the light bulb comes on for the world. So you, you keep showing uh, love to your enemies, and on that day when your enemy mistreats you, and they know that if the tables were turned, how they would respond, and they see mercy in your eyes, and they hear forgiveness from your lips, that's when they'll begin to understand what it's like to receive maybe the mercy from God that they need. So we love our enemies firstly because the world doesn't know God and they need to know God. Uh, Secondly, we love our enemies out of respect that we have for God. Look at verses 18 through 24 as the story goes on. So David allowed his enemy to escape in verse 7. Saul gets up, he finishes his business, and he goes out the cave, returning to his army. And David follows him out and confronts him. And he, as um, Saul is rejoining his army, David stands behind him and he calls out from the mouth of the cave, my Lord, the king. And Saul turns around behind him and he sees David emerging from the cave that he was just in. Can you imagine Saul's shock at that moment to realize the enemy he was pursuing was watching him in the cave? And how, how vulnerable Saul would feel at that moment as he realizes that he was, he was dead. And David let him go. And so as David confronts him, he, notice how he proves his innocence. Firstly, notice how he respects him. He bows to him. And as Saul turns around, immediately what does David do? He bows his face to the ground. He lays prostrate before him. And honor of him as, as he is the king. He bows to him. And then he proves his innocence. Notice how he, he demands that Saul take a close look. Verse 11. Look at how emphatic he says it. Moreover, my father, see, yes, see the corner of your robe in my hand. So he produces the piece of Saul's cloth. And he says, look at it with your own eyes. And see, not only did I have the... Um, opportunity, I had a weapon in my hand, and I didn't use it to cut your throat, I used it to cut the corner off your robe. And of course, you know that in the ancient Near East, a robe is the symbol of a man's status, and so there is no other robe in Israel like the king of Israel's robe. It would be very clear that the piece of cloth in his hand could only have come from that robe, because there is only one robe like it in all the land. It's the king's robe. And and Saul can take that piece, and he can match it exactly to the corner where it came from, and he can see with his own eyes that, un, that he was, Saul was totally unaware that his enemy was in the cave and armed and within arm's reach of him all that while. And so David proves his innocence, and then he tells us, he reveals to us his motivation Saul has, notice how David emphasizes over and over and over again his absolute determination never to harm Saul or raise his hand against him. Look at uh, verse 10. He says, look, this day your eyes have seen that God delivered you into my hand and someone urged me to kill you, but, look at the text, my eye spared you. I had compassion. I looked upon you with compassion and mercy. And I said, I will not stretch out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Do you see in David the determination and resolve within his heart that no matter what happens, he is not going to respond to Saul the way Saul is treating him? He has a steadfast determination in his heart that no matter how badly he is mistreated, or persecuted by Saul, he will never, ever respond in kind. And he says it two more times. Look at verse 12. He says it again. He says, let the Lord judge between you and me. 
and let the Lord avenge me on you, but my hand shall not be against you. And then he says it again in verse 13. Wickedness proceeds from the wicked, but my hand shall not be against you. I am resolved and determined that no matter how I am mistreated, I will not respond in kind. He has resolved to show mercy to those who are mistreating him. The question is, why? And the answer is there in verse 10, because he is the Lord's anointed. In other words, David is determined to show mercy to Saul, not because Saul deserves it, but because he respects God. Out of respect for God's choice of Saul, it is God who chose Saul and made him king. It is, it is God who anointed him through, through Samuel. It is, it is God who put him into that position, and therefore I will honor him even though he doesn't deserve it. He's done everything, to, he has done everything contrary to it. Yet I'm going to honor him. Why? Because I respect God. You know, and that's, that's, that's his primary motivation is out of honor for God. He is determined to, to um, show mercy to his enemies um, simply because he respects the Lord. As he appreciates the mercy that he has received from God, he wants to show that mercy to others. And and friends, if that was the only reason, that should be reason enough. Why should we love our enemies? The answer is because it pleases God. That, that should be a good enough reason. That should be the only reason we need to hear, is that it is good in God's eyes, and it, it, it brings pleasure to Him to see His people respond to, with, respond to hatred with kindness, and to respond with persecution with love, and to respond to with... with to respond to mistreatment with patience. It pleases the Lord. And so out of or our respect and honor for Almighty God, we love our enemies. And so we love our enemies because the world doesn't know God. We honor our enemies because we respect and honor God. We also honor um, and respect our enemies because God is our judge. Look at verses 12 through 15 as, as David continues to explain himself um, and defend himself before Saul. He doesn't just, um, in addition to his respect for God, he reveals his fear for God. That is to say, he's looking forward to judgment. In verses 12 through 15, he, he says it several times. Notice in, both tw- in verse 12 and in verse 15, he calls upon God as his judge. He says, let the Lord judge between you and me. Let the Lord avenge me on you. And then again in verse 15, therefore let the Lord be judge and judge between you and me and see and plead my case and deliver me out of your hand. Now what what is David saying here as he he interacts with Saul? He is in a sense praying to God when he says let the Lord be judge. That is a, a verbalization of his prayer as much as it is his conversation with Saul. And he is entrusting his case and his life and his reputation into God's hands, saying, let the Lord be judged. This is his prayer. But understand this, this is not a prayer for revenge. You know, a lot of people, they, they struggle with David's prayers because many times through the, Saul, through the Psalms, not just in this text, but in many in the Psalms, David prays, may God judge my enemies. May God shatter the teeth of the wicked, he says. I think that's Psalm 3. Um, you know, he, he prays, actually it sounds relatively violent at times, what, God, what David prays against his enemies. But understand this, David is not praying for revenge. He's not praying out of a desire for vengeance and, and, or, or spite. In fact, you should, you should never pray out of an attitude of spite. If you're praying for a desire, if you're praying against someone out of a desire to see revenge on them, your heart is not right and God is not going to hear your prayer. If your prayer is motivated by a desire for vengeance, understand God's not listening to that. And that's not what David is praying for. He's asking for justice. He is entrusting his case into God's hands and he's leaving it there. When David is praying, let the Lord judge between me and you, what he's saying is, if justice needs to be done, God will do it, not me. 
And it is, this prayer is a prayer of faith where David is actively entrusting his life into the hand of God because he knows that God will do whatever, whatever is right. And as he is entrusting it into the hand of God, he is taking it out of his own hands. When David prays for God's justice on his enemies, he's not saying, God, please punish them. He's saying, God, you will do what is right, and I'm leaving it in your hands, and I'm taking it off my shoulders completely. See, it's not a prayer that is an expression of a desire for revenge. It's a, pr- it's a prayer that relieves you of your desire for revenge. It's where you take your desire to see, to see it repaid and you pass that off to God and you take it completely off your shoulders and put it completely onto his. And you say that it is God's job to do, not mine. Justice is something he will exercise and not me. And so as, as David is speaking with Saul, this is the desire of his heart, is to see, that, to see God do what is right. And notice verse 15, God will see it and he will plead my case. He will deliver me out of your hands. If you are fully convinced that God sees how you are mistreated, if you are fully convinced that God himself will plead your case and that God will deliver you, do you need to do anything about it yourself? Do you need to take the matter into your own hands and defend your own reputation against the slander that people are spreading about you at work? Do you need to stand up and and stand toe-to-toe and stand up for yourself when people are mistreating you if you know God is going to take care of it for you? Do you see how your, your understanding that God is judge gives you the freedom to love? Because you know for certain that if someone needs to be punished, that God will do that, that frees you to show them God's mercy. Because God will take care of his justice. And he commands you to show his mercy, so therefore you leave justice into his hand, and that gives you the freedom in Christ to forgive. It gives you the freedom in Christ to show mercy It gives you the freedom in Christ to love even those who hate you because you know if there needs to be a punishment, that is God's job to deal with and never ours. In fact, the, the truth of God's justice is a powerful motivation for us to love our enemies because it gives us, it releases us from the need to defend my own name or reputation. God has my case in mind. He sees everything. He will do what is right. And therefore, I'm free to show love. So we, we love our enemies because they don't know God, because we respect God, and because God is our judge. He is the defender of our cause. And then fourthly and finally, we are commanded to show mercy to our enemies because that is a tool God uses to convict sinners. It provides an opportunity for the gospel. And notice how profoundly this act, this simple act of mercy, how profoundly it touches the heart of this hardened sinner named Saul. So look at verse 16, how he responds. And so it was in our text. As soon as David had finished speaking, notice the instantaneous reaction, literally in Hebrew, as soon as he stopped speaking. It was an instant reaction on the part of Saul that he, he responded, is this your voice, my son David? And he lifted up his voice and wept. That, that's, that's an amazing response on the heart, on, from this hard-hearted king. Uh, you know, as we've been studying the life of Saul and David over the last few months, uh, we've been spending about six months now in 1 Samuel, and we've studied quite a bit about Saul. And as we've, as we've seen him grow and develop, what we've seen is he's, he's grown harder and harder in his heart. He's grown more determined to sin. He's become more and more deceived. He's become more and more determined to do wickedness. But this act of mercy touches that hardened heart and softens it, even just for a little while. And so he weeps. And notice how he almost... 
almost admits that he's wrong. Look at what he says next. He says in verse 17, you are more righteous than I. Notice he doesn't say I'm wrong and you're right. <laughs> he just says you're more right. You know, saying that someone else is more right is not the same thing as saying I was wrong. So he doesn't quite admit that he's wrong, but he does say that David is more right than I am. What does he mean by that? Well, Saul is, he has a moment of clarity here and he understands what would have happened if the tables had been turned. What if it was Saul that was in the cave? And David is the one who walked in to do his business. And Saul was watching him there with a knife in his hand. What would Saul have done? Well, you don't even have to answer. You don't have to guess. There's no, there's no uh, question that he, without hesitation, would have cut his throat. And he wouldn't have batted an eye or blinked before he did it. And yet, when David had that opportunity to do the same to him, the same thing that Saul was trying to do to him and would have loved to have happened to him, David lets him go free. He, he can see the difference now that, he has, now that he has experienced mercy. Now that he has experienced grace, undeserved, from the very person he was mistreating. It gives him a moment of clarity to see the sin that's in his own heart. That he's been refusing and blind to see for years. How hardened is the heart of Saul, but it's mercy that touches it and softens it. And he says, you're, you're more righteous than I. And, and notice how the clarity in his mind, his mind is opened to see the truth and even express the truth. The truth that he has been suppressing and fighting against for years comes out of his mouth. When he says, and now I know for certain that you're going to be king after me, verse 20. That, that is the truth that Saul has been fighting against for years. That, that is the truth he's been hiding away and refusing to acknowledge is that God prefers David to him. And here, in a moment of clarity, he's, a, he's able to express the truth that he's been suppressing in his unrighteousness for so long. And what is it that, that softened his heart? What is it that broke through the fog of his self-deceit? What is it that pierced his ego and popped it? Mercy. When, you, when an evil person who knows that they're mistreating others receives from the target of their persecution forgiveness, grace, mercy, it's a powerful tool in God's hand to bring the conviction of sin to hardened sinners. And don't underestimate the power in God's hand of, of the mercy that you show to others. And, and we, we look beyond it and we say, well, I, I can't do that because it would make me a doormat. Maybe it would make you a doormat, but it might open the kingdom of heaven to a sinner. And isn't, isn't it worth it to endure a little bit of reproach for the sake of Christ, to see another soul saved for all eternity? Is that, is that a trade you're willing to make? To accept a little bit of disrespect? To accept a slap in the face? To accept a few years of mistreatment by a family? To give them a chance of eternal salvation? You can be a tool in the hand of Almighty God to open the door of heaven when you forgive those who are mistreating you. But in this text, we do need to make a distinction. Uh, the sorrow that Saul feels here, unfortunately, even though David gives him the chance to repent by showing him this mercy and confronting him, Saul's sorrow, unfortunately, does not lead to repentance. And the reason we know that is because chapter 26 is coming. Two weeks from today, we're going to be studying about Saul again, hunting after David. At the, when this text ends, he goes home and he stops persecuting him, but that, that change doesn't last very long at all. He's going to be right back to it in chapter 26. So this, the sorrow that Saul feels, the conviction that pierces his heart, is uh, what the Apostle Paul in the book of, in Corinthians describes as a worldly sorrow. There's a, there's a godly sorrow over sin, and there's a worldly sorrow over sin. And the difference between the two is one leads to change and the other does not. 
a worldly sorrow over sin, the kind that Saul feels here, is the kind that makes you feel sorry for your sin, makes you uh, cry about it, makes you admit it to others, and then go right back to doing it tomorrow. That, that's worldly sorrow. And that's the kind of sorrow he has here. It's a sorrow that produces conviction, but it's not a kind of conviction that produces repentance. It's, I'm sorry for what I did. Maybe I'm sorry for how you took it. Um, and, but tomorrow, on Monday, we're back to doing the same thing again. You know, that, that's the kind of sorrow we often feel. But a godly sorrow is a sorrow over sin that produces repentance. And repentance is a change of mind where I'm sorrowful over my sin and I am now resolved by God's grace to go the other direction and begin leaving in the opposite way in which I have. And friends, you understand that the kind of sorrow that leads to repentance is not something you can manufacture by feeling bad about your sin. That can only come through the gift of the Holy Spirit. That comes through, that that kind of conviction comes through the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Ghost. And that is a, a gift of God's grace and mercy. You cannot change yourself. Even though you might feel sorry about the things you've done, you can't change your own heart. Only God can do that. So you throw yourself at the foot of the cross and you ask for God's um, transforming power through the blood of Christ to make you into a new person. And he will, if you ask him, take your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Rely on God's grace to change you and not your own effort because you can't do it in your own strength. The only thing you can manufacture in your own heart is a sorrow over sin that changes nothing. But God's grace can give you a sorrow over sin that changes everything. Trust in Christ, receive the gift of the Spirit, and you will be a new creation. But even though, even though Saul doesn't repent, it's David's mercy gives him the chance. It's only because David loved his enemy and spared him and looked upon him with compassion in his eye that Saul was even able to have the opportunity to repent. So here's the, pri- here's, here's the last uh, the reason why, and maybe the most important reason why, God commands us to love our enemies. And the answer is because he gives them a chance to repent. There is nothing that can soften the heart of a hardened sinner than mercy and grace. As we, as we are determined to love our enemies and do what is right uh, by, by, giving, by forgiving those who don't deserve it, we become an instrument in the hands of God to build his kingdom on this earth. What kind of person does God use to build his kingdom on earth? The kind of person who, like David, shows mercy to his enemies. Be merciful, therefore, as your heavenly Father is merciful, and you will be sons of the Most High. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we confess that the, the ability, even the desire to do these things is beyond us. It runs totally contrary to who we are, um, to repay good for evil. And so, Lord, we, uh, we throw ourselves at the feet of your grace, and we ask that you, by your Spirit, would make us and fashion us into the image of Christ so that we can be truly your children and build your kingdom in this world. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.